it's funny, like, I was arguing with friends about this when when BB announced it, and I was arguing with friends about it during the elections in Israel, and I was saying that BB is not going to annex, annex a thing, and some friends of mine were saying, come on, man, what are you talking about? He announced it, he's going to do it. Excuse me. This is, this is what Trump proposed, and 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 BB's going to do it, and it's going to be great, as Trump likes to say. And, you know, the crazy thing is, guys, is that when Arabs who live under the Palestinian Authority heard about this, I guess, this sovereignty, I don't want to even call, call it annexation, I call it a sovereignty dec declaration or application of sovereignty. When they heard about it, a bunch of them got up and they started moving in droves to either just you know, be with their relatives in, a, you know, places like Jericho and other places in the Jordan Valley, or just moving there, stop moving there, and, oh, excuse me, and, um, why did, why did they want to move there? Because they want to be at least, if not provisional citizens of Israel, they want to be at least not citizens or, or or not have to live under or be administered by the Palestinian Authority. So therefore, the more land Israel has, the more the more land the Arabs uh, who live under the PA, they can they can just move to those places where Israel annexes. So what conclusion can we come to from all of this, my friends? We can, the conclusion can we can come to is that if Israel goes and actually apply sovereignty or 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 Israeli law or just you know pretty much takes what's ours take what what we actually recaptured you know which is basically the cradle of our civilization you're talking about Hebron Shiloh Betel Harbracha um you know I could just I could just go on and on this is basically where Judaism started you know a lot of people talk about you know you talk to a lot of people in the West world, they say, I'm not against, uh, what do they say? I'm not against Jews, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Zionist. And then they even go on to say, they say, I have nothing against your religion. Well, if, let's say we, we go and we, and we say, you know, the Jewish people are just, you know, we're not a nation, we just have a religion. Okay, where did our religion start? Or, yeah, let, let's just go with that. Even if you say it's just a spiritual practice, where did the spiritual practice begin? It began, it didn't begin in Poland, it didn't begin in, um, you know, Russia, it didn't begin in any of these places, it didn't begin in any of the places that we lived in, that we had a strong diaspora. Excuse me. It began, it began in the land of Israel, and it began in places like Shiloh, where we had the tabernacle for 369 years before we even had Jerusalem. It began in places like Jerusalem and Hebron and Harbracha and, um, you know, Gilgal and all these places. And all these places are, guess where? Judea and Samaria or what the world likes to call, or call the West Bank. This is our, this is where we started. And then we fanned out to places like Tel Aviv and to Haifa and all these other places. But we started in that area, the area that is now in contention. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, my friends, so, so basically if we were to apply, you know, sovereignty in, in, the, in the place that we are essentially from, that's, that's where we get our name from, Ju Judea, Jews, um, then the people who live under the PA would go and run to be citizens and be ruled by us. That's essentially what they would do. And uh, now the only issue is, you know, if you have these people living in your, in your, so to speak, kind of municipal, under, under your rule or your, or your um, administration, then you have to give them voting rights. So that's where things get a little bit com complicated, because if you don't give them voting rights, then it just ends up looking like, you know what? It's the, the A word. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's called apartheid. That's the problem. But um, listen, at the end of the day, my friends, there's a lot of people going around and saying, listen, 
um, you know, the Arab nation, the Arabs, the, uh, the, the, the nation called the Arab people, they have about 21 nation states that they can claim as their own. I mean, you know what? Let, let's 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 count it. Let's count how many how many nation states Arabs Arabs actual Arabs live in. We're talking about ethnic Arabs. Um, let's see. They live in. Let's take a look. Let's just look at the Arab League. Here we go. League of Ar League of Arab States. Here we go. They have. Let's see the membership. This is this is minimum. <laughs> so so you guys, some of you guys might come and say, well, some of these people are, are North African. The thing is, they all fa fall under the rubric of Arab. So okay, so you have Algeria, Bahrain, Comoros, Djibouti, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, Oman, Palestine, Qatar. Saudi Arabia, so Somalia, mm, they're not Arabs, Sudan, not Arabs, okay, uh, Syria, Tunisia, UAE, Yemen. So now you have one, you know, let's see, wait a second, who are actually the Arab states? One, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, da, 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 da. nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, sixteen Arab states, my friends. There are sixteen Arab nation states on this planet, and I would venture a guess that at least two or three of them can get together and say, well, wait a minute. These, uh, so to speak, Palestinian Arabs are of actually, they're, dis they're descendant from our lands. Meaning, and I can read to you guys, you know, there's a whole list made. There was a whole list uh, here made of of where Palestinian Arabs actually came from before they came to the land of Israel. Meaning meaning like we we you get you guys could say well we came we came from Poland to Israel. No. We actually our origin is in Israel. We got kicked out of Israel to these diaspora countries. The origin of the of the Arabs who live in Israel today, who live in what's called Israel today or or Israel proper today or even by extension the Palestinian Authority, their origin is not actually that place. Their original origin is somewhere else. Okay, so let's let's look at where these people actually come from. Here we go, here we go. Somebody made a list. This is from Memory TV, and somebody actually made a list. So I'm going to stop playing the music here. Here we go. Now I'll read you guys a list, and it's actually, they related the names of people, like last names of people, to the places where they're from. So you have, see it says Palestinian co Palestinian common family names. Here we go. See it says, just like Saddam Hussein al-Tikriti was born in Tikrit, Iraq. So now you have the family names, the uh, Nisba, which is like the family names of Arabs who now occupy Judea, reveal their country of origin. Masri or al-Masri, Egypt. Hamas member of parliament in Gaza. Mushir al-Masri, the word Masri literally means the Egyptian in Arabic. Hamis from Bahrain, uh, Salem Khan Hamis, Al Ubaidi or Al Ubaidi from Sudan, Al Ubaid, Al Faruqi, Iraq. Okay, you know what? Let's say of Egypt, Egypt, Iraq. We're just writing down country, countries of origin of Palestinians. If I ever get a pen that works. <laughs> Here we go. Iraq, Egypt, Iraq. Oh my God, these pens are going driving me crazy. Um, okay, Al Araj, Morocco, member of the Saudi dynasty Hussein, Hussein Al Araj. Uh, Al Lubnani, the Lebanese. Al Mugrabi, the Moroccan. Maghreb, meaning Western Arabic, usually referring to North Africa. 
Talal Mugrabi, Al Jazair, the Algerian, Al Qurashi, the uh, Saudi Arabian clan of Quraysh, the you know, these are the guys, yeah, who were the Jews live next to. Al Azd, Yemen, the Azd tribe, Al Yamani, Yemen, Isam Al Yamani, Al Afghani, Al Sidawi, the Sidon, Lebanon, Al Fayumi from Fayum, Egypt, Al Hijazi, present day Saudi Arabia, Al Am Hijazi, a Palestinian artist from Hebron, Al Kindi, the Indian, Iman Amin Al Kindi, Al Tamimi, you know, you guys have heard of that girl Tamimi? The tribe or clan of Banu Tamim, Azam Tamini, Tamimi. Uh, Hamati from Syria, Hama City. Omaya, like Omayads, Banu Omaya tribe, uh, Saudi Arabia. Palestinian artist, artist Omaya Joha. Otman, Turkey, Ottoman. Murad, Yemen, Murad tribe. Alawi from Syria, Ira Iraqi. There are people last name Iraqi. Halabi, Aleppo. There's like Jews, we call them Halab. Khal Halabi, Dajani from Saudi Arabia, Matar from Yemen, the village of Bani Matar, Al Baghdadi, Baghdad, Iraq, Tarabulsi from Tripoli, Lebanon, or like Trabelsi, uh, Hurani, Syria, Zubaydi from Iraq, Zubaid tribe, Zakaria Zubaydi, Al Hussein, Saudi Arabia, Saudi. There's people like these are all people with last names, Palestinian people with last name, their and their last names. Uh, Mats Matsrawa, Egypt, Bar Bardawil, Salah Bardawil, Hamas legislator in Gaza, Egypt. Nas Nashasibi, this is a this was a big family uh, at the when when that was actually they were the ones that actually was sold a lot of land to, to Jews back in the day, back in the twenties, from Syria, Nashashibi clan. Bushnak, Bosnia, Zoabi from Iraq, Hanin Zoabi, she's from Iraq. That's her family. Turkey, Dawood Turkey, Al Kurd, Kurdistan. Hadadins, Yemen, descended from Ghassanid Christian Arabs. Arab Abu Arab Abu Kishk, Egypt. Arab al Shakirat, al Arab al Zabidat, Egypt, Egypt, yeah, these are Bedouins, these are all Aramsha, these are all Bedouins. Abu Sitta in Arab, Arabic Abu means father and Sitta means six. Translated and actually means father of six. The Abu Sitta family primarily received this name because around the year 1700, a well known knight of the large Al Tarabin tribe always had six slaves, Fedawiya bodyguards, three on each side with him. They were with him wherever he went, day or night. Hence, the name Abu Sitta, in equal Egyptian Bedouin, Salman Abu Sitta. Nuba, Hebron, founded by the Nuba people. Even Arafat, the most famous Palestinian, or he calls him, Palestinian leader of the terrorist group PLO, is not native to Judea. He called himself a Palestinian refugee and claimed he was born in Jerusalem, but spoke Arabic with an Egyptian dialect. He was born in 1929 in Cairo, Egypt. He served in the Egyptian army, studied in the University of Cairo, lived in Cairo until 19, 1956. Arafat's full name was Mohammed Abdel Rahman Abdel Rauf Arafat Al Qudwa Al Husseini, Al Qudwa tribe origin. Oh, there's more, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Azmi Bishara, uh, a Palestinian Arab. <laughs> My friends, so from this we basically have realized. Ah, here we go. Zuhair Mosen, responsible for the Moor massacre. So, from this we realize, my friends, that basically, if the Arabs were to be taken in by their brethren, the, the Arabs who live in Israel today, who will de facto be in Israel once Israel annexes, if they, we have the guts to annex, which I'll get into in a moment, our entire land, you're talking about countries like, nation-states like Bahrain, Morocco, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen, Le uh, um, who else? Syria, and Saudi Arabia, and I think that's about it, will be obligated, or could be obligated, or, yeah, could be obligated to take these people in. Why? Because these are their brethren. These are their Iraqi, Egyptian, Moroccan, Saudi, Syrian, Lebanese, Yemeni, Yemenite, tribal brethren who came, whose relatives came and invaded what was the land of Israel, my friends. There were Jews always there for thousands of years. So, I'll tell you guys something. What I'm proposing right now is actually a little bit unrealistic. But, you know what? If we're talking about annexation or, or, or applying sovereignty to our land and we're saying like okay these people want to stay fine stay but you know what 
I hate to say it, you know, we have 15 Arab members of the Israeli parliament out of 120 people, out of 120 Knesset members. We are not, a, we are not about to double that number. I'll tell you guys right, that right now. We are not about to double that number. Mm -hmm. And if we do double that number, then we're going to have to figure out a way how to double the number of right-wing or, yeah, pretty much right-wing Knesset members, and basically eliminate the left wing in Israel. We're talking about the left wing Jews. And then we can get into a situation where we have, let's say, you know, 90 or 80, you know, or even 70, well, let's say 80 maximum, uh, minimum, 80 Jewish Knesset members, who most of whom are right wing, or at least centrist, definitely not Meretz, definitely not these other guys. And then we can even, and we can even have a conversation about having 40, 40 Arab members of Knesset. Some of them are, will be uh, maybe Christian, some of them will be, you know, most of them will be Muslim, you know, um, and then we were going to have to get into a situation where we say, okay, now we're going to apply some elements of Torah law, not theocracy, but we're going to have to apply something called the laws of the Ger Toshav, the laws of the non-Jew who lives in your land, who lives among you, the non-Jew who lives among you, we're going to have to come and we're going to have to apply these laws. And we're going to be well within our rights to do so. And yeah, my friends, that's what we're going to have to do. That's what we're going to have to do. Instead of giving people voting rights, because again, like the Western world is really stuck on these things of like, well, democracy. I have, I have news for everybody. The Jewish people, our system, has actually technically nothing to do with democracy. The reason we've been living under a democratic system for all these years is because... We kind of had to, like, you know, so to speak, be accepted by the civilized world. Um, the irony is that we are seeing now that these systems are kind of breaking down. Even democracy itself is breaking down. Why? Because it, be, it can be in, easily infiltrated by things like Marxism and, uh, you know, all these kind of subversive systems and just downright scoundrels, like people who subvert democracies, right? Democracies have holes in them. Democracies can be used by people who use its own rights for their own polit political gain. For example, if you guys see the, what the Muslims are doing or Islamists are doing in America, they came to America and they're using the system against itself. They're using the freedoms that, that are afforded to them in America, just like they're doing in Europe, to basically take over from within. So now you have a system. Now you, you, you go to Israel. Now you, we have actually laws that are, that are or, or ideas that come from the Torah that talk about a concept called Ger Toshav. <clears throat> and, and, and if we're going to talk about, you know, applying sovereignty to our own land, and people who are not of our, so to speak, of our, um, you know, our nation who are living amongst us, we're not going to kick them out, obviously. We're not going to have, you know, these countries that I just listed, Egypt, Egypt Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon and Syria and Yemen and whatever, take these guys in unless they want to which I don't think they do, they can't handle them, they can't even handle their own people, you know, the economies and all that kind of stuff, and all their, all their balagan, all their mishigas, but, okay, so, so now we're talking about, about a situation um, called Ger Toshav. So let's read really quickly what Ger Toshav actually means. See, it says, Ger Toshav um, is a term in Judaism for a Gentile, non-Jew, living in the land of Israel, who, who agrees to be bound that by the seven laws of Noah. A set of imperatives which, according to the Talmud, were given by God as a binding set of laws to the children of Noah. Actually, Arabs are also part of that. That is all of humanity. Our Ger Toshav, therefore, is commonly deemed a righteous Gentile. Um, you know, this is kind of ex an extension of that. So I'm going to read to you guys. A Ger Toshav, literally a resident stranger, is a Gentile who accepts the authority of the Torah and the rabbis upon himself, but specifically as applied to Gentiles. The term Ger Toshav may be used in a formal and informal sense. In the formal sense, Ger Toshav is a Gentile who officially accepts the seven laws, Nohad laws, as binding upon himself in the presence of a Beit Din. See, it says, uh, in the Talmud, there are two other differing opinions um, as to what the Ger Toshav, Ger Toshav accepts upon himself. To abstain from idolatrous, practi idolatrous practices of any kind. So, okay, so we now know the Arabs are probably even more Muslim, more Muslim, or even more strict than Jews are on that stuff. So he says, to uphold 613 commandments and a rabbinical enumer enumeration, except for the prohibition against eating kosher animals that died by means other than ritual slaughter, or possibly uh, 
any prohibition not involving karet. So basically, my friends, like, if you guys look at the way Muslims live today, Arabs look today, these two general things are not an issue, would not be an issue for them. They're already, like, ripe and ready to be become a ger toshav. And I'll get into, in a moment, why that's going to be a problem for them. But that why my, my why that may be the only solution in this particular case. Okay. The accepted opinion is that a ger toshav must accept the seven no hide laws before a rabbinical court of three. He will receive okay, legal protection and privileges from the community. Here, one second, guys. I'm just going to move this over. The rules regarding the Jewish-Gentile relations relations are modified, and there is an obligation to render him aid when in need. The restrictions on having a Gentile do work for a Jew on Shabbat are also greater when the Gentile is a ger toshav. So basically, like, we can't hire Arabs to do anything on, on Shabbat. In the informal sense, Ger Toshav is the one who accepts the Noahide laws and alternatively simply rejects idolatry. The latter issue is particular. Okay, so, la 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 la, this gets on to the halachot, to all the halachas. Okay, so basically, ah, see, so it says, um, see, so it's modern times and views. Um, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, Rav Rebbe, encourages his followers on many occasions to teach the seven laws of Noah, devoting some of his addresses to the subtleties of this code. Since the 1990s, Orthodox rabbis in Israel, most not- notably those of Chabad Lubavitch and religious Zionist organizations, including the Temple Institute, have set up a modern Noahide movement. These organizations are aimed at non... Okay, so this just talks about all the modern-day stuff that's going on. So, my friends, so basically... Um, this would be a solution if Israel was to apply, apply sovereignty to the, the entirety of Judea and Samaria today, mm-hmm. and if if Arabs lived under the administration of the Jews, and if we did not give them voting rights, and we said, you know, to the to, to, to the modern world, which is basically collapsing on its own, so to speak, democracy, we we, we ba- if we basically told them, listen, guys. Here's how we're going to do things. We're not going to give these people any more voting rights than they already have, because they already have 50, 15 members in the Knesset. What we're going to do is going to, we're, going to, we're going to designate them as Ger Toshav, Ger Toshavim. And these people, they're going to have to tell us, they're going to have to agree, uh, okay, you guys have to live, abide by the laws of the land, and um, we already know you guys can, can you know, you're not, you don't do idolatry because you guys are even more machmir than we are, even more strict than we are. Uh, we already know you guys have no issues with, um, here, what does it say here? No issues with, uh, you know, not eating non-kosher animals, you, know, you guys don't eat pork, stuff like that. Okay, so there's no issues, what's the big deal? All you guys have to do is not, not want to kill us. That's really the main thing. So here's, here's the problem with all this, my, my friends. The problem with all this is that Islam, the Quran, has within it principles that basically say once Islam conquers a certain land, that land belongs to Islam. And it actually has nothing to do with the Arabs per se. It has to do with Islamic law. This is this is law that uh, Muhammad set down. Because, because again, his so to speak, ideology, his religion was one of conquering. He wanted to conquer the entire world and convert the entire world. So he said, basically, once I conquer something, it becomes, you know, it's like he made, he made a, what's called a hazaka on it. He, uh, he has acquired it. So it doesn't matter who reconquers it. It doesn't matter about the Reconquista and this and that and the other. It doesn't matter if the Jews come back. It doesn't matter if, you know, Spain conquers back, uh, you know, Andalus. It doesn't matter whoever came back and reconquered their land from you. It doesn't matter about the Crusades. Whatever Islam had, once had, if it had one millimeter of something, it belongs to Islam, no matter what. The Martians can land from the moon, we can have war of the worlds, not from, from space, we can have, uh, you know, Mars attacks, eh, eh, eh. it doesn't matter, my friends. Once Islam conquers something, if they go and they build a space program and they go conquer Mars, Mars, and even if America comes there and says, you know, Mars is partially ours and this and that and blah, 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 and then Putin comes there and says, you know, I'm planting a flag here. In the minds of the Muslim, Mars is all his. So this is basically our main hurdle, my friends. Our hurdles are not the UN, our hurdles are not NATO, our hurdles are not, I don't know, I'm sorry, the EU, our hurdles are not Trump or or any president. They're not even BB. They are just our own guts 
and our willingness to deal with the issue, our willingness to come to the people who live in the land alongside of us and tell them, listen, um, we're the boss here now because we have been, because it's our really it's our land, because again, you guys came, your origins, our origins are from here. We just got kicked out and we came back. Your origins are not actually from here. Your or, you guys are the invaders. We're not the invaders. You guys are the invaders. You invaded us from Morocco, Egypt, Iraq, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and, and Libya, and Yemen. But we're being very nice to our brother Ishmael. We're being very, very nice. And we're saying, okay, you can stay. Some of you guys already have, you know, seats in the Knesset. Uh, it gets a little dicey if we give you any more. It gets a little dicey. We're going to lose our state. Really, we will. It's, it's, it's the truth. It's a God's honest truth. It's not apartheid. It's just, it's just emes. It's, it's just the emet. Mm -hmm. So here's what we're going to do. You know, as he, as, 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 uh, what's his name? That little gangster guy in the, uh, you guys have seen the WB cartoons with uh, Bugs Money? Tell you what I'm going to do. Okay? Tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to give you guys Ger Toshav status. By the way, that is actually a very special status in the land of Israel, to be a Ger Toshav. And if you guys can live under that, you guys are not going to be second-class citizens. You guys are going to be welcome. You live, you guys are actually going to be Israeli citizens. You're going to get all, the, all actually all the benefits, economic benefits of Israel, as Israeli citizens. Um, you know, access to, to work. Uh, you know, guys, I don't know if you know this, like, even now, most of the construction workers in, in the Jewish towns in Judea and Samaria, many of them are actually... Arab, these are people who live under the PA. Why do they come to the construction for Jews? Because the Jews, I'll just give you an example for the purposes of this illustration, whereas a, a PA, uh, you know, construction company or, you know, the government will pay them, let's say, 3,000 shekels a month or four, the Jewish one will pay them or a Jewish project will pay them 6,000, 5,000, 6,000, maybe even up to 8,000, basically double. So now, in the case of Israel applying sovereignty, these people are not going to have to go through checkpoints and walls and all these other issues. Yeah, there's going to be security, right? There's going to be security, but at the same time, these people are not going to be under the PA. What does that mean? That means that these people will not, let's say, there's not going to be any incentive to commit a, you know, a, a what is it called, a terrorist attack, because right now, what happens? One of these young guys, he goes and, goes and commits an attack. What happens? He knows that his family is going to get a life stipend, for life stipend from the Palestinian Authority. Where does this money come from that they got, the Palestinian Authority? The money came from the EU, from the UN, and from American taxpayer dollars, my friends. Go to pay for these the families of these terrorists. So now, the PA becomes irrelevant because all these people all of a sudden are under Israeli law. Um... Even Bibi is not going to pay, or Meretz, they're not going to pay money to the families of, of God forbid, Arabs who go to attack, um, you know, people in Tel Aviv, God forbid, or other places, right? They're just not going to do that. We're not going to name streets after these guys, you know, Ahmed or Mustafa or whoever. We're not going to pay their families money, stipends, and that's it. There's nothing to be financially to be gained for anybody. Unless these guys are just, they don't care, and, you know, they're like these, like, Afghani guys who we offered, you know, if you guys remember from America, offered, you know, thousands or millions of dollars to find Bin Laden, and they, and they, they totally didn't take the money, and these guys just care about, you know, ideology, which, mm, I don't know. You want to talk about Hamas, that's a separate conversation, but for these people, it's, it's at the end of the day... Listen, my friends, there was already an idea pushed forth by, like, Moshe Faglin you know, the, the, the MK, basically to offer $250,000 to every family just to leave. I don't know if you guys know this, like, there's, there are Arabs who are selling homes in the old city, you know, the, in, the, in, the, in the Muslim quarter, to Jews. And these people have to be sent, uh, have to make arrangements to leave the country. Why? Because if, if they're found out that they sold a home to a Jew, it's actually illegal under PA, Palestinian law, and this person could be put in jail or even killed you know, rubbed out completely, you know, so, listen, if a Jew sells a home to an Arab, we're not going to do anything to him, he can do whatever he wants, right, <laughs> but if, but if, but if an uh, Arab sells a home to a Jew, he's going to have big problems with his own people, okay, so, 
Listen, my friend, so these are the two, really the two choices. Either these countries can come along and say, and we can make deals with them and say, listen, we're going to take in some of these people. Because anyway, some of these families that live in Judea and Samaria, these Arab families, they actually have homes and relatives in these places. They have relatives and homes in Egypt and Saudi and UAE, in Iraq and in Morocco, you know, in, um, what is it, in Jordan and in Syria. 100%, I know this for a fact. And, and, and they live well, they have money, right? They have vacation homes, this, that, they travel back and forth. It's no issues for them. So, so now we're talking about, these people are basically just there, you know, just to make a, at this point, it's just to make a point. And now they're saying, well, this is our home, this, that, and the other. Listen, my friends, okay, let's let bygones be bygones. You know, their relatives invaded our land, you know, hundreds of years ago. Okay, they can stay. But they can stay as a ger toshav. They can stay as a person who accepts our rule in this land, because it is ours, just like they accepted it in 1967 when they threw rice at the weddings of soldiers in Hebron, and they were, and they were at that time, if you ask a lot of older Arabs, they were saying, we thought the Yehud, the Jew, they beat us fair and square, and we actually thought, okay, the Yehud is back, and they're going to annex, they're taking, they're going to take their land, and what did we do? What did, what did we do? Nothing. <laughs> we didn't take anything, we sent a couple of people out there to build little homes, and we had, you know, arguments between ourselves, should we, should we not, should we dismantle, should we approve, should we this, should we that, oh, what's legal, what's not, hilltop, this, 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 we don't know, we don't, you know, this Woody Allen situation, we, internally, with the Jews, this is, our, it, it, my friends, it all comes from us, all these other people, they're, they're just a symptom of our ineptitude, of our stupidity, eternal, you know, as Rabbi Mizrahi likes to say, why, because we are the dumbest nation on earth, <laughs> we must, you know, we're still to this day, to this day, you know, this guy's coming and saying, like Pompeo just said a couple weeks ago, you guys can do whatever you want, annex whatever you want. And then Bibi said, we don't know, maybe Jordan Valley, maybe Efrat, maybe this, but enclaves, but this, we don't know, how, blah, blah, me, ma, mu, ma, me. Blah. And now we're stuck. And now we're talking about, well, maybe these countries, maybe we'll take them in. Or maybe Kertoshav, or maybe that, or maybe this, or maybe apartheid, or like, my friends, we did this to ourselves. We did this to ourselves, and and even the Arabs were were waiting for us to annex our land in 1967 when we beat them, because they understood, okay, in in their world it's like might makes right. So if we beat them, we came back to our land, and even the Quran says that the land belongs to us. And if we came back, that means that that's something, right? But if we didn't annex it that all we did was we showed them that it's not really our land. And now we have this schizophrenia situation going on. And now they're yelling, and now they're well within their rights to yell to the world, well, these guys are imposters and fakers. Look, they, did, they beat us in 67, but they're really occupiers. What are they doing over here? And now we're coming, and now we're saying even today, well, eh, I'm going to annex it, maybe I'm not going to annex it. Eh. And, and now you, you see there's like people planning a Palestinian day of rage, and this and that. My friends... If we go and we annex the whole land, the whole thing, the whole kin caboodle, and we're talking about including Shiloh and Adeyad and Eshkodesh and this place called Maoz Ester, these little tiny, you know, hilltops and, and enclaves, and also the big places, and Harbracha and Beit El and Ofra, you know, and, and Kirat Arba, and Hevron, and Susi, and all these places, my friends, at some point people will realize what we've done, and they will say, you know what, you know what, these guys, as much as we thought they were fakers, these guys are not fakers. These guys are the real deal, they are the Jewish people, they are back, they finally did it. Wow, we actually didn't think they'd do it, but they freaking did it, they flippin' did it. And there's gonna be some people, just like there were people when we bombed, you know, Iraq, you know, the Osirak reactor in 1981, and they're going to make a stink in public, they're going to go make a stink at the UN, they're going to make a stink at the EU, and a stink here, everywhere a stink stink, but you know what, my friends? This is all part of the Geula, the Moshiach process, and the Geula is unstoppable and irrevocable, and if only Bibi and any other politician who, who has the power to do something about it realizes this and comes and realizes this, he will know what he's supposed to do, and I'll read you guys something from, and I haven't I haven't read this to you guys in a while because I used to read you guys uh, some, you know, the stuff from rabbis from the Mekubalim. <clears throat> I'll read to you guys the whole thing from uh, Rabbi Nirbin Artsi in the Tivot. 
This is what he wrote for this week's Parsha. He talked about all the current events that are going on, and this is the advice that he gave. This is what he wrote. For Trump's deal of the century, the Israeli government should take what's good for Israel and throw away the bad. The creator does a job from the top, complicates the U.S., things inside the U.S., complicates Trump and the White House. If Trump goes with the will of the Jews in Israel, he will have all the best in the world. Meaning, if the Jews annex the whole land, and Trump says, okay, that's wonderful, all the stuff that you guys see here in America, poof! Like the U.S. and Russia and every country in the world, why are the people of Israel not so successful the Palestinians? Because the Jews are too merciful. The creator, of the, the creator of the world says, don't feel sorry for, the, for those who are brutal, not Hamas, not Islamic Jihad, Palestinians, nobody. Not to be afraid of any country in the world to make decisions for Israel alone and not to take anyone into consideration, anyone's opinion. The Arabs have dozens of large states and nothing will happen if they take Hamas and the, Pal and the, PA, the people under the PA. Another two million people. Nothing's going to happen to, this is what this guy's saying, nothing's going to happen to Egypt, Iraq, and, and Syria and Lebanon and Morocco, well, maybe Syria because they have a war. <laughs> and Yemen, well, they have war too, so fine. Nothing's going to happen to Egypt and Iraq. Well, sort of. <laughs> and Jordan. See, it says, Trump is preoccupied with corona, elections, and anti-Semitism, and is looking for a way to retract the deal of the century. He is dealing with severe complications in America. Middle East and Arab states are in a difficult economic situation, eating each other, cheating and lying to each other, and wanting to kill each other. Iran and Turkey will, do this, will be the same and worse. Iran and Turkey want to conquer Syria, not to make order, but to make, take parts of it. Yeah, because each one of them want, uh, they want their uh, empires back. The Persian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, stuff like that. Syria has been erased and will continue to be erased. Okay, so I guess they're not going back to Syria. <laughs> Iran go, will go up in flames. Corona will eat it. The, fam the famine will eat it. And he will receive the ten most severe blows, like, in, like, in, like the Egyptians, like in ancient Egypt. If Iran makes a mistake, an error against Israel, it will be erased from the earth and from the sky. And they actually know that, though. The, the, the Ayatollah knows that. Israel has control, since so talking about Corona, Israel has control over the Corona because of the young men who scoffed and didn't keep to themselves. The Corona returned. Don't say, this won't happen to me. Although the Corona is back, Israel is controlling it. You have to follow the instructions of the Ministry of Health. Holy Land has livelihood for everybody. The livelihood is from the Creator of the world. Hundreds of corona patients will come to Israel, if not thousands, if, if they're not stopped. You're talking about like tourists. It is better to wait than to flood Israel with coronavirus patients. The Blessed One, Hashem, is continuing to uncover the scammers, thievers, thiever, yeah, thievers, thieves, conspirators and bribers, adulterers and greedy from the white collar to the black collar, religious and ultra-orthodox and non-observant Torah and, mit and mitzvah observant, all are revealed. Creator of the world says to the, says to the Jews abroad, my children... Come quickly to Israel before the Gentiles eat you alive. The Gentiles abroad do a fine job. Not all Gentiles, but enough. <laughs> the Gentiles abroad, 50% of them, do a fine job to deport the Jews and help them to go away and come home to Israel. Since the Blessed One, Blessed Be He, called Jacob to Israel, hatred begun and it continues until this moment. So, my friends, this is what we have before us. We're either going to annex the entire land, and Trump is going to be okay with it, and he will be, and everything will be fine for him in America. You know, America will get back to relative non-insanity. Or we're not going to do what we're supposed to do, and we're just going to de delay the inevitable. The inevitable. <laughs> I sound like Kim Jong-il. The inevitable. Inevitable. Yes, my friends. So that's where we're at. So, if, like, I, like I said in a previous podcast... If we're not going to do it July 1st, which is actually today, we could do it in Tubav. If we're not going to do it on Tubav, August when? August 4th, 5th, 6th, something like that. If we're not going to do it then, we could do it on Rosh Hodesh Elul. If we're not going to do it on Rosh Hodesh Elul, we can do it on just before Rosh Hashanah. Or we can do, announce it. You know what we could do? We can announce it at the UN General Assembly if we, if we even have one. Or we can do it on in Heshvan, when the temple is supposed to be inaugurated. Or we can do it on Hanukkah. My friends, if we don't do it today, it's going to get done at some point. And if Bibi's not going to do it, someone else is going to do it. Because I'll tell you guys right now, the majority of Israel, if we have another election, the majority of Israel is a right-wing country, or a traditional right-wing country, if not, if not religious. And um, whoever we elect next, if Bibi has to go away, he's going to be even more right-wing than Bibi, I'll tell you guys right now. He's going to be a person who 
is really strong on Judea and Samaria and is really strong on, you know, Jewish values and all these kind of things. And that's it. And that'll be the end of that. That will be the end of that. That will be the end of for any two-state solutions and any or dissolutions or any, any Oslo's, Accords, any of these things. We'll have done what we're supposed to do. We'll, we will have accelerated the, the Geula process, the redemption Mashiach process. And that's it. That is it, my friends. That'll be that. Anyway, so we have a choice, or the Arabs have a choice. Either they can get together with their brethren in places like Egypt and in Lebanon and in Jordan and in Saudi Arabia and, and like Arab Emirates. They could say, listen, guys, come on. Or they can or they can say, listen, we can live as Gerat Toshavim, and that'll be that. The choice is yours, my friends, and the choice is also ours. All right, guys, have a good night.